All right, so the plan here now before break is to give you a motivation introduction. Very briefly say what's really happening in our Jupyter Lab. We will then in the exercise together write our first notebook. For many of you, it will not be the first notebook. I realize that. So for those of you who use notebooks, would like to do a bit more and are a bit underwhelmed here, we have lots of other examples. So have a look. Let's see what we see on examples. We have examples for widgets, interactive data fitting, cell profiling, magics. There is a lot here. A lot of examples. Take the one that is closest to your interests. I also promise to have something interesting for those of you who write R. And Jupyter is also for R developers, but I mean, if I would write, if I would be an R developer, I would probably rather use R Studio and R Markdown. But if if you get like bored here on the way and it's it sounds very far away from how you work, I recommend that you look at sharing notebooks. So I will come back to that, but I just want to tell you where that is. And then you can try, there is an optional exercise. Try to deploy your R Markdown or R Studio project via Binder. I think this is incredibly useful. I mean, I still believe the first part is useful for our developer because what mm -hmm. you will show about uh, JupyterLab, JupyterLab is a full ecosystem. It does more than uh, mm -hmm. sharing notebooks. I mean, it's more than notebooks. Yes. Uh, you can uh, extend it. Um, and for sharing, it can be sometimes better to use it rather than sharing our studio. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, and for writing everything you will uh, explain for like writing documentation, interactive documentation is valid for our markdown anyway. I mean, yes. the philosophy. Exactly. Great point. Let's go, let's jump in and let's see what it is. Uh, so I will go into this first episode here, Jupyter Notebooks and motivate why we, why we even do that. And what we see in the picture here is one of the first notebooks, Galileo's drawings of the Jupiter moons. I think this was also one of the motivations for calling this project Jupiter, which, which is a tool that allows us to have text, images, equations, figures, plots, code, all in one place. It's like a lab notebook. Like if I would do experiments and take notes as I go, and I can have them all in one place, and it can form a nice story. And the name <clears throat> derives from Jupiter. I'm actually now using so much Jupiter that when I talk about the Jupiter planet, I, I now also use the Y. So it's Julia and Python and R, but today you can use lots of other commas and there is a list, dozens of programming languages. But I think these three are maybe the most typical ones together with Jupiter. And we have here, two really nice case examples. And I want to, one is the gravitational waves. And what is really beautiful about these case studies is that they put all their analysis as notebooks, as Jupyter notebooks on GitHub. We can have a look at this. So all the notebook is here. It's this one. And there is this binder button, and we will later also create that for our notebook. So we can launch this notebook uh, dynamically in the cloud. And this will take like a few seconds. Actually, I have it already prepared. So if I switch to a different tab, so after a few seconds, it looks like this. And here I can really go in and I can uh, rerun their analysis. So this was the, so this, this means something. And then from this, they could uh, extrapolate this really inter interesting information. So I can rerun the analysis. I can go in and see what happens if I change the 30 to 40. And really this analysis then is reproducible for others and it's reusable. 
and uh, we will later see how, how to do that. So, so I mean, for those who are not familiar with notebooks, this is what is a notebook here. Yes, so that's a yeah. notebook. What we see here are cells. And we see that there are code cells. So there's some Python code. But we can also have cells where we have text markdown. And, and then you can have here plots and images and equations. Are there any equations here? No, but we could have them. So this is what where we want to get at the end of this, this lesson. We want to be able to do these notebooks and we, we, we want to be able to put them on GitHub and run them on, on Binder. And there is another example here, which is activity inequality, also a beautiful project uh, about studying how people move, how much they move and how healthy they are based on mobile phone location data. And also here, the the notebooks are on, on GitHub. And here is a gallery of tons of interesting Jupyter notebooks sorted by academic uh, discipline. So you can find the one that is closest to your academic discipline for inspiration and how they solve. And you can add your uh, notebooks and your examples. It's yeah. exactly what we discussed about um, collaborative work. Here you can edit. I mean, you can propose some changes and add some new links. Yeah, so a really great source of inspiration here. So what are notebooks really good for? They are good for linear workflows. And here I already used the word workflow. I think later we can discuss whether this is really a workflow or not. But it's good for linear flow. So we read the data, we filter it, we do something with it, we plot it. It's, it's very good for that. It's good for experimentation. If I want to try something out interactively, um, it's I think also great for teaching. Uh, we you can make presentations using Jupyter. For me personally, uh, maybe the most important motivation is that I think it's a great way of providing supplementary information together with a published article, because it starts out as a digital ad notebook, but then over time, it's it's perfect supplementary information because it will it will contain all the steps. And if I then win the lottery and I leave the research group, then the rest of the research group can still reproduce all the steps that I that I did, and they can reproduce the plots. So it means uh, mostly it can replace uh, or it can complement uh, when we have additional information in uh, in in. Uh when we publish, it's uh, for like plotting. Is it how you would use it? Or you would even add more? Um, I'm just trying to think I'm, I'm writing my paper and normally I'm adding um, plots, mm -hmm. individual plots. So now instead I will add notebook. Oh, this one stopped. Yeah, so instead of like the way I've done it too often, unfortunately, is that I have somewhere on my hard drive I had some scripts that generated a plot. And then the plot I put into publication. Yes, that's what we do normally. Yeah, but later if somebody wanted to actually reuse that later, or if myself, yeah. Or if um, you know I submit it, but then it goes through a lengthy review, and at the end people want to have changes to the to the figures, so I, they want to have a different color or a different, mm -hmm. and then suddenly I don't know where are the scripts anymore. And this way I can have everything attached to the paper. So these plots they do, they would, they would then end up in a paper, but then uh, the whole story is then also findable and accessible and reusable. And reusable. So, I mean, here's the emphasis is on the reusability that mm -hmm. you can make again your plots as many times as you want to change the colors, but you can also reuse the same notebook for different data. Yes. Some pitfalls. Um, so it's less good for, and this is this is the same. No, it's the same for our studio, our markdown, as is for Jupyter and for other similar tools that I will also mention later. It's less good if for something that is nonlinear. So if this is a large code base, uh, and it's not like a linear, you know, read, filter, plot. Uh, then it's maybe less suitable. 
I mean, it, it means it doesn't really replace, for instance, snake make. Correct. This is not a workflow management uh, right. system. This is probably why we also show you snake make and we put some emphasis on workflow management system. It complements it. Yes. Then another problem when you use Jupyter Notebooks, you have to be a little bit careful when you use version control, but we will show you how you can do that. So there will be a demo on that. Uh, those of you who use our Markdown don't have that problem because in our Markdown, you write directly Markdown. So then uh, there is no problem with version control, but I will, I will show you what, what I mean by that. And here is a list of other pitfalls. So you can have a look. So they are not good for everything, but still good to know about them. They are good for many things. Um, two, two good practices that I would like us to remember, and I will come back to it, and we will try to get it into our muscle memory, is that when we create a new notebook, it, it is named by default untitled. So one of the first things I will do is I will always rename it, because I don't want to have on my hard drive untitled 2, untitled 3, untitled 4 so that I can know I know what's inside. <clears throat> and then the other thing that I will emphasize is that it's really good practice to run all the cells from top to bottom before I save the notebook, before I put it on GitHub, before I share it with my colleague. And I will show why. So these are maybe two things, two take home messages. Did I miss anything before moving on? Yeah, I think you got the most important part here, and uh, we are looking forward to it. We want to try it out now. Yes, so we are like maximum we are five five minutes away from our exercise. Maybe, maybe uh, ten. Radon, uh, so there was one question. Uh, this linear and non-linear programming, can you explain a little bit what, what is it about? Yes, I think this is what we try to explain with workflow management system, that it doesn't really replace um, workflow management system. So it does one thing after the other. Yeah, let me see what I can have on a better example. Here also, let's, let's look at this, this study here, this activity inequality. Let's look at some notebook. And I will actually now open the notebook. So here they have named it as figures. Let's open any of these. I open them now on GitHub, not directly on Binder. So they will be. Thinking and thinking. So I cannot modify them, but I can still look at them. Um, well, maybe not a great example. Let's go back to a linear. But still a that... great example. I mean, any example is a great example because what what we what you want to mean is uh, there is an order. Yes, right. Yes, and the order is always the same. Exactly. So we define some data. We read it from file. Do we read anything here? Uh, we yeah we. Thing. And the dependencies are linear. So one cell uh, needs to, like cell two here, needs to be executed before yeah. cell three, etc. Well, when we have workflow management system like SnakeMake, we can eventually run several tasks in parallel. Yeah. Which we we can do a, a bit more. It's more difficult here. Does and it clarify, Sabri, or is it? Um, is it more confusing? <laughs> um, no, no I, I think it will be more clearer when you come to the examples later on. It just when, when um, yeah. uh, somebody's asking. What, what's yeah, it yeah, yeah. No, but what we wanted to put uh, some emphasis on is it doesn't replace what we have taught uh, yesterday on uh, on workflow management system like SnakeMake. I think at, at least this is what I would like to see. Rather than I don't know if you have any other. Yeah. I think that's a really good summary. So we are, I would say, eight minutes away from an exercise, but let me, so we'll go to the next episode here. What to give you a high level overview of what is going on without going into any details. And here what I will do, and this you can already prepare, but you can do that in the exercise. We will, we will create, a, I will open up a notebook we will create a new folder. So I will create this new folder, Jupyter demo. Did I call it Jupyter demo? Jupyter lab demo, it's just let's be similar to. 
so that you can do in the exercise. And what you will then do is open up a Jupyter Lab. And we also have then screenshots on how that looks in the next episode. This will then open up a browser. In my case, I want I, I want to choose which browser it opens because of the way I'm screen sharing things. So if I do no browser, I can select in which browser I want it to open. But if you Useful leave out- Useful if you have many different browsers. Yes. That you do. So now I can decide, I can, I can open this address in my browser. Uh, let's see, is it open the right one? Actually it did. Yeah. So once, once you open Jupyter Lab, this is how it looks. I'm not currently in a Git repository, fine. Hmm. I will come back to that later. Um, I can toggle, I can close this. If I click on that, I can close this thing away. The interesting thing for us today will be this Python 3 tab. And this is the so-called kernel. So in our case, it's Python, but it could be R, it could be Julia, it could be some other language. And once I open this, I, I said that the first thing that you should do inside the exercise is to rename untitled to something else. Okay. And sorry, too many tabs. And the big picture is that what I see is the browser, but it somehow interacts with the kernel. And kernel, in my case, is Python. And here are some hints about navigation and shortcuts, but I will not go, to, not go into them. I cannot remember them. Actually, there is only one shortcut that I remember, but I will repeat that. But I, I just want you, you to know where you find them. The only thing I want to show here is that in the notebook, we can choose between between code. So this cell can be either code or it can be markdown or it can be raw and I have no idea what that is, but I normally choose between these two. And markdown is for documentation. And here I can copy paste, I can try it out. So let me copy this. So this is markdown syntax and we will hear more about markdown later today. I can copy paste. And really the only shortcut that I remember is Shift enter. So with shift enter, I run the cell and I create a new cell. And if I don't remember the shortcut, it's not a problem because I can push on the play button. So then it will also run the cell. So this is a markdown cell, but I can also have a code cell. And in, in a code cell, that can be Python code. Hello from code cell. So here uh, it's Python code because you have the Python 3 kernel at the top. We can yes. see. Yeah. And I could switch to another kernel if I had another kernel installed. Yeah. In my case, I only had Python 3 installed. And again, how do I run? I can either do the play button or I can do shift enter. And then it tells me hello from the code cell. And I think that's. Oh yeah, and I, I will. The second thing that I told you that we should always remember is to run all the cells from top to bottom. How do you do that? So I can either run them one by one, but at the end, before saving, before sharing, I want to do run all cells. And I'm sure there is some shortcut that I don't know. But when I run all the cells, it will run all of them. So does it mean it will restart from the top? Yes. Yeah. So that's what we want to check that everything is uh, publishable. No, that's what we should do before yeah. publishing. And I think I will then later show you why that is so important because I will make a mistake on purpose later. But before introducing a lot more, I want to go to the exercise. So we, we have one question maybe before. Mm -hmm. um, we always show how to uh, start Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab. Can you show us how to stop it? 
the right way to stop it? And I think <laughs> this is a good question. Because it's I, a great question I, because I, I think I stop it the wrong way. Uh, the way I do it is that I forget that I have this browser tab. Yes, I, I often do the same. That's why then, I think it's a good question. Yeah, then inside my terminal, I, in, inside one of my terminals, I find then a hoof. There is something still running. And then I click Control C a lot many times, and then it will die. So I can actually I can do it now. Control C, shut down the server. Then sometimes I don't know what to answer even, so I do again Control C, Control C, Control C, and now it's done. And back to the browser. Oh no, where is the browser? Here. So now the browser tells me that oof, something happened. Yeah. It is. So there's some audio in the background. Yes. Sir. And uh, now I see this server connection error. And that means that, well, there is, it stopped running. So now the browser side cannot talk to anything anymore. So what now stopped working is I stopped this. And now the browser doesn't know what to do. So that's how I stop it. What is the better way? Uh, yes, there is a quit button <laughs> in the menu. Oh yeah, but now it will complain. There is a, a logout and a shutdown. And... Oh yeah, here logout shutdown. So that's the correct way. Yeah, usually shut down. And now let me prepare the exercise. So the in the exercise, um, your goal is to build up the first notebook. Here are some screenshots on how. So this is how we started Jupyter Lab on the tab. This is what I did before. In the exercise, we will create seven, eight, eight cells. Some of them are markdown cells. Some of them are code cells. Here we create some Python code. We will plot something. It doesn't matter so much, actually, what... Here, the focus is not the Python code. So the goal is not to understand what is happening inside the Python code. But to give you a big picture, what we do here is that we imagine that we are throwing darts on a dartboard. And depending on whether we end up in the unit circle or outside, from this, we can estimate pi. So at the end of the notebook, we will get an estimate for pi. So hopefully something close to 3.14. And we will also see a plot. There will be a plot coming up. There will be an image. There are some equations and a title. And your goal will be to get this to run. Those of you who are more advanced with notebooks, have a look at these extra examples. Here is how it should look at the end. This one. So here we will throw dots, and we will count how many red, how many blue. We will get a plot. And at the end, we will get an estimate of 4 pi. And what you can then try is that if you increase the number of points, you should get actually closer to the true pi value. And then we will come back. And I will show you one problem. I will make a mistake. But you can also try that mistake in yourself in the exercise room. Um, are we ready to? Open up the breakout rooms. Did was was that clear or not so clear? We are ready to open the rooms. Yeah. So fifteen minutes. And I think it was very clear. And uh, maybe you can uh, say again that if, if this is uh, you have already done quickly this exercise, look at the other additional yes. examples. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe you can also add in the HackMD uh, things you you would like to, to see uh, and you haven't seen. Yeah. Because uh, it's also, quite evolving, this lesson. And try to make these mistakes, maybe, if you have time. Yes. Or you can also have a look at the discussion that we will later have. So 15 minutes, we will be back. Uh, let's do yes. some math, 9.47. Yes, 47. Mm -hmm. And I'll copy the
Ale ta bota byl, že bota šut nejde do nás, to do dezinfekce on stream. So we we'll start my Jupyter lab. And here this is where we see this uh, Jupyter lab interface is a bit uh, annoying sometimes because it, it takes a lot of space. Yeah, this part I find, but also I'm like zoomed in a lot. Okay, I will create that. Rename. Starts. Exercise. And now I need to copy paste. The first was a uh, markdown cell. And I can see that things are changing here because now it looks, it thinks that this is a Python comment. But now when I change the markdown, it shift enter and I get a title. Yeah, I think we have a few uh, people who had the same problem. When they run it, they forget yeah. to uh, switch to uh, markdown. Yeah, let me let me actually show how it looks when I when I do it wrong. Yeah. So I'll run this, and now it thinks that this is a Python comment, and then it starts interpreting minus square, and it chokes on on here. So it it doesn't know what that means in Python. But then I can go back and change that, and now it's and the next thing is again a Markdown cell. What is the shortcut here to toggle? I, I think it's possible to switch. Let me look into my shortcuts. I don't remember actually. Shortcut. The to toggle between code and markdown? Yes. yes. It's uh, control M and control Y. Oh, oh excellent. This. Yes, toggle between markdown. Thank Let's you. See. Control M. First, you go to yeah. uh, command mode, escape, control M. Yes, awesome. So for me, there is no control. It's just oh, I... Y and M. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. That's right. Okay, I got the picture. And now, and now it will be called cells. Good. So there is this. We import some modules. Maybe you can zoom out when. Uh... To, to first, yeah. yeah, I think it's better. So here I'm importing. And I could actually now, I could put all this Python code into one single cell. Um, but so how hear... do you know you split? Hmm, yeah. What is the rationale? Because I think we had uh, this question too. Hmm. Um, I, 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 I would still put it in two different cells. I always put imports in one cell and then the code in another one. Yeah, I like to have that separate somewhere on somewhere towards the top of the notebook, yeah. the imports, and then comes on the code. Then there is no good, there is no like one way of doing it, but I like to have cells in a size that I might want to copy paste this cell into another notebook. So that would be like a good size. So if I have too much in this cell, then it's. Um, like for instance here, I have a function that this, well, it's not a function, but here a code that throw the dots and counts how many are inside the circle and how many are outside. And if I wanted to reuse this in a different notebook, then that could be a good size because maybe I'm not interested in everything else. So that's how I, but yeah, one, can, one good... can combine spells and there is no like hard and fast rule. Yeah, but it's a bit like uh, here you have a, a command for each cell, so it's a, it's a good way. Whenever wherever you add a command, sometimes it's good 
practice to split. Mm -hmm. And here you have all the plotting. It's good practice. I mean, you always put the plotting in one cell. Yeah. And so here also the numbering is interesting because I have number two, number three, suddenly number five. And why is that? Because every time I run a cell, it gets a number. Mm -hmm. And here I ran this twice. It, it didn't do any harm, but that's why it jumped from three to five. Like I can run it again and it will be seven. And then I can run this one and it will be eight. But of course this order can matter. I mean, I'll come back to that. And finally, let's compute a fraction. And the fraction happens to be the number of points inside divided by all the points times four. Not a great estimate. No, I mean, and here maybe actually we could mention the last cell and what you don't print. Yeah. And you still have this value. So does it work if I'm not in a notebook? So it would work in a Python in a Python um, shell? Interactive, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, in a Python interactive, I mean, REPL, what is it? Read, evaluate, yeah. parse loops, or something like that. Okay. Mm. Yes. Print loop, yeah. So there it would work, but not in a, in, not in a Python script. Um, so is but, it a pitfall we should uh, uh, be aware, for instance, when, when we start to have long notebook, we tend to move back to like function, etc. So is it better to try to use print? I think or it would be maybe locally? better, yeah. So this can be nice for like interactive experimenting, but this is maybe slightly better because if I would copy all that code or I could actually save it to a Python script. I don't remember how, but I can save it to... You can save, uh, yeah. And As... then it will be better actually with the print because it will run anywhere. In a notebook, if a notebook will print the the output, if I so I don't actually, I don't need to specify that, and I will maybe leave it just once people are back but from the exercise. It only print the last one. No? If you have yes. two, yes. Um, so it's it's important to note because I have seen this mistake many times. Let's try. Yeah, we get the last one. Yes. So now we have an estimate and I could now get a better estimate by having more of these. Two, more, more, more So points. here this is what we call a, you really experiment. Let's say you are trying to, um, mm -hmm. to test and try out. You have a new algorithm and you, you try to find out what is the best uh, way to do it. So you go back and forth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Still not very good. Now let's try. Let's, I don't know how far I can go before making my computer here unresponsive. But oh, it's getting better. It's getting better. Yes. Yes, so now I got a notebook and why is it untitled again? I didn't. Oh. So, 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 uh, because we are restart? No, I'm not sure. And now, well, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, did you enter? Or? That's weird. Please remain. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe well, you need to click on rename or explicitly. I used to do exactly what you do. How do you? There is a rename button, uh, the blue button, but it's it's weird because mine is. Uh... Oh, okay. Maybe. Exercise rename. Oh, I can't rename. Okay, that's weird. Yeah, mine works. Strange. If you close it and you look at your uh, browser, I mean, uh, is... so if we close, I saved, I close. Oh, but maybe you have an error message and we could see it in your terminal. 
How far are they? Ah, that's fine. It already exists. Yes. Ah, okay, yes. Good. That's a good, uh, I never noticed that. <laughs> and it's too bad that notebook interface doesn't show it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, it's, uh, so, ah, so I don't know what happened. So we uh, opened twice. Oh, this was, a, this was the old one, I was a supportive exercise. Ah, yeah, 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 yes, of course. Okay, so this is how we'll call it different, I will call it darts. All right, yeah, interesting error. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so this one I want to get maybe rid of. Well, well, you can keep it. I mean, I, they, they would uh, keep it, but then it's weird that we don't get an error message. It's still running, actually. Eh? So here you are killing, you are doing tw two things at the same time. Maybe you can show how to see what is active, what is running and not running. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. It's uh, on the left, you have the tab, the second one, this uh, square, yeah, this one. Uh -huh. And you can shut down. Uh, so I can do this? Yeah, it will shut down, which is like the proper way to do it. Oh yeah, good. Well, how did you, you see, see that it was running? It's because you have this green dot. Okay. And then we don't have it anymore. So it's I not actually, running. I actually want to delete it because for the follow-up, just to have less things there. Yes. I'm not deleting the wrong one. Okay, and now I'm saving. I'll just have a look here in my terminal and whether... Oh. Should be, oh no, where did I create the folder? Okay, I wrote it in the wrong folder, all right. Here we are, all right. Good. Yeah, oh, it's already... going. Oh, sorry. Go it's going quite uh, okay in the breakout rooms, mm -hmm. and uh, I wonder if uh, we should be closing them or. Oh yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. One minute. Yes, you're right. That would be perfect. Diana. Thank you. I think maybe one thing we should mention, Radovan, is that uh, uh, we haven't talked about uh, interaction with data. Um, and also the fact that everything we have we do now is local. It doesn't need any internet connection mm -hmm. because I, I see some confusion in the in the HackMD in the question. Okay. That uh, um, this is not shared yet. So everything is local on a computer. You don't need internet so far. Um, right. And uh, they also have question on how to deal with data. So everyone is now back from the breakout rooms. Great, welcome back. Uh, and thanks for the questions on HackMD and the comments, and we will comment on them. First of all, let's have a look at the notebook that we got. So maybe you got something that looks like this. I then experimented a bit here. So I increased it to 50,000. And I got a plot with lots of these points inside, and then I got a pretty okay estimate for pi. A um, few things that you may have noticed in the breakout room, but maybe not, is that what are these numbers here? So here I jump from 2 to 18 to 19. Every time we run a cell, it will get the number. And here I, you can already see that I ran this thing a couple of times because I experimented. I changed the number of points, I ran them again, and that's why the number went up. You have maybe also seen that you don't have to run the cells in the right order. And then you can get some interesting effects. So let me make a mistake here because nothing prevents me from maybe accidentally actually redefining them points. What if I define it to 5,000 accidentally, I run the cell, 
What number will it get? 22, I think. Yes. But then I can go to this cell here and I can run that one again. And then we will see something interesting. So now I got a problem here. And this is because I didn't run them in the right order. And that can happen <coughs> in when, when testing, experimenting, it can happen that I run these things in the wrong order. And this is why I was emphasizing that before I save it and before I share it with others, I want to run all the cells. Because if I would share the notebook now with my colleague, well, I would see this number, but my colleague would see something else because the first thing that my colleague will do is run all the cells. So just that we get the same experience, this is really good practice to do. So now I'll run all of them. I mean, you say this is good practice, but is it something you do at the very end or quite regularly? Because I, I do it very often. Yeah, often. But at least before like saving or committing changes. Yeah. Because I, I have been caught by this problem where um, I, I experiment a lot of things and then it works. It's really nice plot. And uh, then it, when I rerun, it, it's broken. So if you have done a lot of work, this is like for version, version control. Do it maybe as many as as frequently as you would version control your code. And then we have questions about data. So here we have we are running this notebook a bit in isolation. We it's running only on our computer, and we are not really reading data from anywhere because all the data that we need we actually create it. We create some random data, but often you want to read your data. You either want to read them from disk. Um, and what is then a common practice is to put the data close to the notebook in the same Git repository maybe. And then we can somewhere in the early in the notebook, we read the data and then we process it. We can also read the data from a web resource. And um, in one of these examples, in the pandas example, I think, not sure. But for sure, Pandas has a nice function of reading data from a CSV or, or from a database or, or from any format uh, that can sit on the web. But so I mean, the, at the end, it's not very different from what we normally no. do without a notebook. So it's maybe exactly. Yeah. Yes. But it's good, good to have data management. Yeah, good data management should be uh, always a must whether you use notebook or not. Yes. And the, the confusion is with when you share. Yes. We would need to have data accessible, but this is not the case right now because everything is local. Yeah, so it's good to, it's good if the data, like if I give the notebook to somebody, it's good if the somebody can then also access the data. So when I read the data, I should not read it from some very fixed path on my hard drive because my colleague yes. will not have the same hard drive. So instead, maybe reading from the same Git repository. And but data can be large, so you don't put data in a Git repository. Mm -hmm. It can be on an archive. It could yeah, be on exactly. Zenodo. So yeah. I could actually fetch it directly off from Zenodo or from you know my community archive, university archive, depending on the size. Yeah, so good practice for data management as uh, if you are using a Python code or any programming. Yeah. It doesn't replace data management. Yes, so let me save this one. Then there is a question for you. You can think about it. I think there is no right or wrong answer, but it's good to think about that. Here we put some comments in as a code comment. So this is a Python comment. And here is a Python comment, just to tell you what's what's going on, more or less. What we could have done, we could have also documented it as a markdown cell. And I mean, we could discuss, should we do this or should we do the other? What is the advantage? I think it's good to think about it. I think there are pros and cons. I think I would like to use, so in we will take a break in 10 minutes, but before the break, I wanted to show you one more thing. And that is how, how a notebook interacts with Git. And then we will take a break. And after the break, we will try out the binder service. And for this demonstration, I will save the notebook 
I will go back to my material and find the right place. And it's the next episode. Notebooks and version control. And I will show what is written here. But the first thing I want to show is that we have a problem with the Jupyter Notebooks. And the problem is that the way they are saved is they save in JSON format. And let me show you how that format looks. So this is the notebook that we have created, example notebook. That's the one. So this is how it looks really in our notebook, in our Jupyter lab. But if you look at how does it really look, how is it saved? It's this one. So this is a JSON format. So this is how it's really saved underneath. And we can make some sense of it. So probably this is a cell and this is another cell. But the complication is that when we, and I will show you that, when we then do small changes in the notebook, it can end up as pretty big changes in this JSON. And then using Git can be not very convenient. But fortunately, there are these great tools. So there's integrations. So there is NB done. And this is for so notebook and the diff and merge. So this will simplify pairing and merging changes. And I will demonstrate that. There is JupyterLab Git, which is a Git extension. And it's already installed because it's part of this code refinery conda environment. So it's this thing here. But it, it tells me that I'm currently not in a Git repository. So I should maybe initialize. I'll do that in a moment. <clears throat> and then there is Jupyter of GitHub, which I will not show, but I just want you to know that it exists. So you can interact with GitHub directly out of Jupyter Lab. I mean, here you talk about like extension, Jupyter Lab extension. Can we say maybe a bit yeah. something yes, about so this are... and uh, how to be careful with extension? Yeah. So it has, these two are Jupyter Lab Git, Jupyter Lab GitHub. They are extensions. This one we already installed, and it brings with it NBDIME. So NBDIME gets installed together with Jupyter Lab Git. I would. If you want to explore more extensions, and there are dozens, to have a look at the official documentation, because it also discusses how to install them and how to manage them, and also to be a bit careful like where they come from. So to check that this is like an official extension and not, because you install extensions that then run on your computer. So we should use the same care that we use when we install uh, packages and when we use Docker containers and Singularity containers, but I recommend them. So here there is more info on that. Yep. And I first, so let me demonstrate that thing and I will follow this instructor note and I will go into my terminal. No, I will not go into my terminal. Yes, I should. In the terminal, I'm here in my this is where my notebook is. Let's try git status. And this is also a good, good reminder of what we discussed last week. So I have this notebook, and it would be good to track it with Git. Currently, it's not. How do I initialize Git repository? I could do that now out of JupyterLab. So inside my JupyterLab, I can actually also initialize. But I, I want to remind us how that was in on the command line, it was git init. Git init, git status. Now I see hmm, there is the notebook and there is something else. But maybe I want to ignore this. So these are gen these are some checkpoints that notebook saves. It's good that it saves it on my hard drive, but maybe I don't want that to be in my Git repository. Is it maybe or is it 100% sure you don't want to have them? So I'm not 100% sure. I would put them in a, in a git ignore. I don't know whether this is really the best practice, but that's what I would do. I, I, I always put them uh, yeah. in the Git ignore. Otherwise, you it's very hard um, when you make like pull requests and you diff. 
it, it, it will end up having many other codes in it. So good practice, always put it in your Git ignore. So now I put that in a Git ignore. And now I don't see that anymore, but I see now Git ignore. So Git add, I want to have that in my repository. I want to have this in my repository. And how, is, how do we save changes? How do we commit changes? Git commit minus M, saving my notebook. Good. Now I want to see whether Jupyter Lab also sees that or not. And maybe I need to actually restart it so that it can see this at all. Hmm. Should see uh, this Git button, but it, it, it's not large enough. Yeah. But this this is for uh, GitHub. This one. So this this one should be it. I will. What I will do is I will close this tab again and reopen it because hmm. I've seen that. Yeah, yes, thing. usually yeah. So let's do again this ugly control C, control C, control C. And now let's start it again. And now I'm in our Git repository. So now it sees that there is a main branch. We can state changes. There is a history. So now we recognize these things already from the terminal last week. And now let me make a change to the no, to the notebook. Actually, let me make two changes. One change will be I change change red to orange, orange. And the other thing I want to change is I want to change these dimensions for whatever reason. Let me run all the cells. Run all cells. Color changed, the figure is slightly different. So I made these two changes, let's save. I will save them. Oh yeah, now I can show you that there's actually a terminal in the, I can open a terminal directly in the Jupyter lab. That will be a good excuse for me to also show that one. And let maybe is it tiny git status what happened something changed but if i now do git diff it will be i will see you know lots of things changed here although i really changed just two things i changed this but there is yeah the number of the cell numbering changed this is the image you know it it will it's difficult for me now to compare uh, what changed to diff and merge unless I use this and be done. So let's do it now with and be done. And I can go back to the git. I can see now that something changed here. And this is really too big font, but there is this plus minus that I can click on. And now it's suddenly much more useful. Let me close. So this was red is before, green is after. I changed something over here. I changed something over here. And the image also changed. And this tool really helps comparing changes. It helps merging. I'm now using it in the Jupyter Lab. But you can also use it in the terminal. So here is also some screenshots, and you can use it on the command line, and you can even you can tell Git to always use this when comparing notebooks. And then also in the command line, you will get a really nice comparison. So that's really uh, great. If you are using notebooks, this, this is what we should do. Always. Yes, I think so. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and so I showed actually this one, which implicitly uses and be done. I didn't show Jupyter GitHub, Jupyter like GitHub, but there you can pull, push, clone uh, notebooks directly from GitHub. I think you can already do a lot with the Jupyter Lab Git. The same. Uh, you yes. have this cloud. Uh, you can also set it up. Yes. 
Let me know if there is anything burning on the hack and D that we should comment before the break. <laughs> Maybe we take a break and we comment after, or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, let's do that. So it's six past on my clock, so let's be back 16 past. So break until 16 past the hour. Yeah, and we look at um, the HackMD. If there are any pending question or um, important aspect, we'll discuss it after. And I'll open the rooms in case uh, any of you would like to socialize during the break. You can save, and I will save the notebook onto my hard drive. And what you what you will do in the exercise room is create a Git repository. And I will show you now a very, as a reminder, how to do that on GitHub. So, and if this also, this should work perfectly fine also on GitLab, but I'll demonstrate it on GitHub. I will create a new folder here, a new repository, new repository, and let's call it Binder demo, demonstrating something. You want this to be public, and I will start with the readme file. Yes, I want the readme file. And we want the license also. It's good to do. We told her that yesterday. Well, some license is better than no license. I will take this one, MIT. Doesn't matter. Create repository. And now you can either clone, git add, git commit, git push. Maybe even more convenient, you can add the file directly here. So I will do it directly here. Upload file. Where is the file that I downloaded? It's, I put it here, darts. So here's my notebook, adding my darts notebook commit. I'm not sure you added your file, did you? Okay. Yes, awesome. Yeah, here it is. I can look at the notebook on GitHub. But there are two problems with it. One problem is it's just a static image that I can't really click and modify anything. I can't go in and change anything. The second problem that I have is the dependencies. Here are my dependencies. They are not really documented anywhere. So if I would then try to run this in three years later, it might not give the same result. And this is where this wonderful service binder comes in. So your goal in the exercise will be also create a repository, upload the notebook, any notebook, create a file in the Git repository called requirements.txt. And in there, you can list all the dependencies that you need. If you use this notebook, it only depends on this one, this plotting library and a specific version. But I could list several of them with specific versions. So why do you list specific version? Can you tell us? Because then, good practice. Because what will what this binder service will do? It will create. Uh, it will set up this environment based on these versions. So even in future, when this library evolves, and at some point there will be a matplotlib four dot zero dot something, and things will change, my notebook will still work because it will set up environment with that particular version. And in the exercise. Um, go to this binder.org and in here, sorry, here's my example. In here you, so this service, which is open, open source, it turns a Git repository into an interactive notebook in with a well-defined environment. And you can, so I can do this because it's a GitHub repository, but instead you can use GitLab, Zenodo, wonderful. So you can publish your notebook as a supporting information with the DOI and then 
use this directly here, Figshare, Dataverse. And now copy the URL below to share your binder with others. And I think what we ask you then to do is to copy this, this one, add it to your readme. Let's add this badge here. And I know that this is really quick, but we will have time. Adding binder badge, commit. And now anybody can launch it. Well, I forgot actually, I forgot this requirements of text. But so once what you... will happen, it will still start. It will start, but it uh, will not be able to execute uh, all the cells. Yeah, I think it will tell me that it doesn't have Matplotlib installed. But it's only when you start to execute the notebook. Yes. So what I forgot here is to add requirements.txt. Nope, that was the wrong thing. Add file, create new file, requirements.txt, and inside should go this one. Oh, we need not plot the so good practice, even in a hurry, you always add a proper git message mm -hmm. when you commit. Very good for the one. Yeah, and that's all I needed. So now I can launch it. And so please try it out in the in, in your breakout room. And this thing will spin for a couple of seconds. It installs, in fact, a Docker image. So it in, it is it creates a Docker container for me in with that specific environment. It will run for some time. After a while, it will then evaporate again. So I can go in, I can change things, or they will not be saved anywhere. But, it, but we have an interactive reproducible notebook that anybody can run. And also the, the other nice thing is that anybody can run the notebook and they don't even have to have Jupyter installed because they can run it in their browser. So that's another advantage I forgot to say. But let's use 15 minutes to test it out. We will then come back. After that, I will announce a very short break, and then we will switch switch lessons. I think maybe before, can we say about data? What would you do about data? Because Sabri said we should mention something. Yeah, that's, so what, what if our notebook needs data? Where should I put it? Where would you put it, Anna? Uh, I mean, large data, I always put them in the repository. Um, which is the dedicated for climate, if I, because I'm working in the climate domain. I will not put them in the, in the repository, but I always put some sample files mm -hmm. in the repo so they can try it out. Oh, that's a good idea. So to have like a small example that demonstrates the yeah. notebook and to make sure that the notebook is working, but then the real data is on a data archive. And we use more and more cloud storage, object storage for this reason. So you can access data mm -hmm. remotely. So if, it, if it, it's it will like... not replace uh, data management, I think this is what we said before. Sorry, mm -hmm. right No, but if it, if it like one megabyte, couple of megabytes, I would maybe put I it in the repository yeah. directly here. Yeah. If it's like more- Climate data is uh, rarely, yeah. uh, is always yeah. bigger. <laughs> if it's a gigabyte already, I would not put that in a GitHub. If it's like gigabytes, terabytes, it has to be some other place. But I think it's good when you do the exercise to think about how you would use this mind binder for your project and uh, maybe come up with question on where you would put the data. Because it's, as you share uh, the computing environment, you would need to share data and you would need to have a strategy for this, which is not covered here. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry that I was confusing with the breakout rooms, but I would say let's open it now. Then we, when we come back, there will be a super short summary. And then we will uh, switch yeah, over. We need to, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh, it was a good question. And let me see here on stream whether this worked for me. So the breakout room are open. They are open now. And 15 minutes. Um... And it actually let me on stream now. Let me summarize again what I did because it was a bit too, too quick. I have. Oh, oh, I have uh, created a GitHub repository, but can be any, actually any public repository on basically anywhere. 
I have uh, uploaded my notebook. And the, the key file here was the requirements of text where I document my dependencies. In this case, only one. And in this case, it's good practice to really pin these versions. As, because as Matplotlib will evolve and interfaces will change, my notebook will not automatically adapt to them. So I want to pin it to this version where I know that this is working. And the other thing I did is to add this batch, but really, if I look at the source of readme.md. Yeah. And why requirement.txt and not environment.yaml? Which maybe is a question some people would. Uh, I think both is, uh, both is possible. I think yeah. your binder can work with either of the two. Yes. But is, it, is there a difference? One is pip and one is not? Or is, do you use environment? I mean, here we have only one dependency. There is no channel. It's quite simple. Mm -hmm. So requirement is probably the best way to go. Yeah, I think requirements of text is good if you are typically working with PyPI and virtual environments. If you are rather typically working with Conda, then environment with YAML will be the more natural choice. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So I have chosen the requirements of text because I'm more familiar with it, with it but both are I possible. Mean, in that case, it, uh, it's, uh, it, would, it would make sense. Yeah. And then, so we added this requirements of text and I added this badge, but really the only thing that the badge it does is it adds an image and redirects to this address. And this address, mybounder.org version two, GitHub, this is the name of my um, GitHub repository. Here it points to head, instead it could point to a branch. So there could be main here, there could be some other branch, there could be a tag. And all it does, it, it takes me to that address. Then on the fly, it will create this Docker container for me, install the dependencies, now it's installing something. The first time this can take seconds or minutes, depending on how much we install but it will also remember it for a while. So I would then start it. The next time I'm starting it, it takes less time to spin I up. think it depends if you are still in the same, uh, I don't know if this is like domain or whatever, because now they have more mm -hmm. than one. Yes. I right, noticed, right. Uh, um, yeah. I, I'm not sure how they dispatch. Yeah, and now it's trying to push this image to somewhere, but it will almost, but it's a great service, I think. It yeah. Should, uh... So it's one of a service. One can also self-host it. So yes. if, if a university or a community decides to run their own yeah. binder service, it's possible. I tried to convince Sigma 2 to run their own. Mm -hmm. I haven't managed yet. Yeah, I think it would be good to have. This is a good, why is it taking so much time? OK, now. Yeah, so pushing the like... image takes a bit of time. And launching server. And very soon I will get advice on speeding up. No, no, it's not. And it looks actually slightly different than my Jupyter lab because it's really, it's not Jupyter lab, it's Jupyter notebook. That doesn't matter much. But you can start a Jupyter lab, no? You can turn it on. Uh, yes, it's possible. Yeah, right. You, you replace three by lab. Yes. And here I can start the notebook. And also here, what will be the first thing I will do is I will run all the cells. I'll run all. And it seems to work. And Which is great, that, you can change. Yeah, I can go in and really modify things. So here, let's change this to 100,000. It's not your laptop, so you can use yeah, it. Yeah, this is somebody else's <laughs> computer, and so uh, it, it's pretty nice estimate. And something that I will also say later when people are back from the breakout room is that this is demonstrating uh, Python code and requirements of text, but there is a lot more that you can do. 
So he will link to the binder documentation and collection of example repositories so that one can look for inspiration. And in fact, one can run almost anything on that service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we run climate model on that service, actually. Yeah. It's really uh, it's great just for testing. Or so Julia, LaTeX, yeah. R, anything there is. So, so here also this example is nice that one can run R Markdown, R Studio. So in this case, instead of requirements of text, there is one needs, there are different ways of doing it, but one way is to have a runtime.txt, which specifies what is the R version, and to have an installed R, which specifies the dependencies. And then I can run uh, R Studio there. Yes, this is really great for sharing. And if you have your own Docker file, you can even run your own Docker container, it can be anything. I think yes. there, so there is a limitation on the, on the, on the, size. On the size and on the, so both, I think, memory, I mean, data, and yes. there is a limitation on time. But it's, uh, I mean, it's because this is a free service, but the, yeah. the, the binder itself, you can self-host it, and there is no limitation in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, any provider could uh, provide this service to users. Yes. Let me have a look how it's going in the breakout rooms. Because... Can you clarify how long the exercise lasts? Yeah, I didn't do that, but we started, I think, 10 minutes ago. So I, my plan was to go until 40 past. I will put Should we here. send a message to them or broadcast a message? They have yes. five minutes left? Or... Yeah, actually four minutes left. Because then, what, the, should I send a message or someone is sending? Oh, it's already sent. I have wow. Yes, yeah. awesome. <laughs> of course. Because when we are back, I, I actually wanted to mention these, and that's it. Because then I wanted to take a five minute break. Yes. So that we can start 45 with the documentation. Yeah. I, I, I think we are on time now. It's going well. I mean, we have. Five minutes left. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's fine because the plan was to start 45 with documentation, so it's actually according to plan. It it always takes a bit longer than plan, but I think we we did strike an okay balance. Okay, everyone is back now. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. Sorry if this was too short time. We realized that like downloading, uploading, creating the repository takes a bit of time. It it also can take a bit of time the first time for binder to spin up but hopefully hopefully the steps here are well documented we will also now take a five minute break before the next lesson starts where you can we will again open breakout rooms we will also be around after 12 30 cet to help out answer questions before we go to the break i wanted to say that here in this example we tried a python code but it doesn't have to be python and it doesn't have to be requirements of text. It can be environment YAML. Have a look at this binder documentation and collection of example repositories. And for inspiration, and you will see that one can run almost anything on binder. Jupyter, LaTeX, Docker, R, RStudio. So here's an example of deploying an R project uh, to binder. Yes. And there is a lot more to say, but time is limited. We will catch up via HackMD. Uh, I want to thank Anne for co-teaching here. Let's take a five minute break where we switch screens, adapt for the next lesson where we talk about documentation. So break until 47. And thanks Radovan for this Jupyter ecosystem walk around. I mean, walk yes. Through. I, think, I hope we have now an idea how to best use it and not to misuse it. Yes, breakout rooms are open, good.